Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our fourth webinar in our Bulletproof Your Business series. Uh, today, we're looking at uh, cloud-hosted cybersecurity solutions. Um, this is a, a, a very interesting topic. We've covered it uh, a couple of times um, in, the, in the past, in the recent months. Uh, today, David Lees will be, will be hosting the, the webinar. Uh, he's the joint CEO of Eintree. With us as well is Stephen Cohen. He's the Business Development and Strategy Director. And then we also welcome our, our third panelist, Jeremy Matthews, who's the CEO of Panda for the African regions. Guys, welcome. Uh, Dave, you wanna take over? Thank you, Yaka, and welcome to everybody who's watching. Just a bit of a recap, as I always do at the beginning of these webinars. This is the fourth one, so this will be the third recap. Uh, the picture you're looking at right now is really a, a picture of all the elements of cloud that we're going to be talking about in our series of webinars. Uh, what you're actually looking at is a picture of how Eintree operates. And <clears throat> this is not something we created as a, a, a result of the coronavirus or the lockdown. This is something that we've been doing anyway. And in the last few weeks, we'd actually been designing this webinar series because we saw how well it was working for us. And what actually happened when the lockdown became reality it was very easy for us to just pick up our laptops, uh, everyone in our office and go and work from home, which is the kind of little people you see at the bottom of the slide. Um, I'm sure some of you have got some of these elements. So I would imagine a lot of you have got some form of backup offsite. Uh, a lot of you using Office 365, probably not a lot of you using Teams, and hopefully most of those watching today watched the previous webinar, which, which I thought was a really cool uh, depiction of how Microsoft Teams allows you to collaborate. Um, and some of you might even be uh, doing some cloud hosting, but probably not a lot of you have got all of these elements in place. Um, uh, the, the way we're working from home, I don't think anyone would really know if they found our office. And just to give you an idea of how, um, re how remote working and, and broadcasting is possible, uh, the people that are on this webinar today, Yaka is speaking from Somerset West, Stephen is in Johannesburg, uh, Jeremy, and I, Jeremy and I are in Cape Town, but in, in totally different suburbs in Cape Town. Okay, so today we're talking about cybersecurity and um, I'm going to bring Jeremy in uh, for some of these slides and he'll give you some really good insights from from a Panda perspective. And this, uh, I think Jeremy is quite an expert on cybersecurity, not, not only in the product that, that he um, represents, but just the sort of landscape of the cybersecurity threat. And a lot of you might not realize how big it is, but this, these, these stats are probably a few weeks old. So they're probably um, slightly different, but, but not much. There's a new version of malware every, uh, every 39 seconds. Uh, well, I'm just going to read the stats off the slides. 43% are then target SMEs. Now, that's quite important because a lot of you might think that uh, cyber criminals target only big enterprise companies where they can extract large amounts of money, but that's not true. And then later in this presentation, we'll explain to you why that's not true. Uh, most malware comes through email. Um, and I think the last point there, 95% of attacks are a result of human error. And that's you know, clicking on, a, on a, a, a suspicious link in your email, it's uh, introducing a, a remote a USB drive or remote, a removable hard drive with spam on it. There's a whole lot of things which humans do which create uh, opportunities for cybercrime. Okay, and what has really changed in the last few years? Why has cybercrime become such a big issue? And it's because it's a big business. Um, it's a two trillion dollar plus business. These are guys that that are that would make more out of cyber crime than drug drug trafficking, and it's far less likely that they're going to be caught. Um, a couple of years ago, one of the major players in this industry was, I think, a Russian guy who was sitting on a yacht in the in the um, Red Sea or something with good internet connection and sending out ransomware um, malware, and and really you know, getting in thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a day. So these guys, these cyber criminals have now formed their own call centers where if you get hit with ransomware, you can call in their call center. Sometimes they'll even let you do a, 
like a budget payment over six months on your credit card. Um, some of them offer cybercrime as a service to other criminals. Um, they, they, they sell credit card details to, to other cyber criminals in, in the so-called dark web, which I don't know much about and I've never been on the dark web, but certain people have shown me. You can go into the dark web and actually buy, uh, uh, subscribe to a, a, a website which will tell you if your malware is going to beat other an, most antivirus um, uh, protection or not. So what you do is you create your own piece of malware, you'd subscribe to the service, you'd run it against uh, their, their engine, and, and you'll just refine it until they tell you, well, okay, send it out in the wild now because no one's going to pick it up. So it is really a, a very big business. And what's enabled this business is uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, the graph which you can see, I mean, um, uh, look, I've, I've been a, in this industry, I'm kind of giving away my age a little bit, I think, but since uh, uh, the early 90s, when uh, there, there were not many antivirus packages, the one that, that uh, Steve, you'll remember this, that when I was with Softline, uh, with Stephen and a couple of other guys, we had an agency for product called Dr. Solomon's, which was a antivirus system which came on a floppy disk and I think you got one floppy disk every month with the new virus that was uh, active that month and it really wasn't a big issue but in, as you can see on the graph in the last few years this has become very pervasive and the reason is because of cryptocurrency so you don't have to send a check in the mail uh, you don't even have to do an EFT which is traceable cryptocurrency has enabled cyber criminals to extract ransomware from companies that's totally untraceable. Um, and that's quite a scary thought. Jeremy, I want to bring you in at this point and maybe if you can just go through the next few slides and, and tell people a little bit more about this whole cybersecurity um, scenario. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so who needs to take cyber security seriously? Uh, the reality is that, um, that everybody does. Uh, because effectively anybody with a device um, that uses all the sort of digital resources and applications and programs in one context or another uh, is um, at risk. If you think of how society has changed, and we're very aware of this at the moment with the current crisis, is that we've seen the physical being displaced by the digital and that is true of of crime so uh, what has <coughs> happened is you've got this huge issue in terms of, of of crime having moved into the digital space and <coughs> one of the things to keep in mind is the value of data and of information right so there are various measures for this but people typically say that it's uh, and of course uh, it, it's probably particularly true at the moment that uh, d data has more value uh, than than gold if you can come up with some sort of measure so think about the assets that you have that you can associate um, value to so from a business perspective some of the things to keep in mind is this aspect of the value of the data that's within the organization. And that can be your IP that has significant value uh, to your business in, uh, in sort of competitive terms and differentiation. But then if you have customer details, your customers, uh, the value of that information if you have a business where you have credit card details of your customers and personal information, uh, that raises the ante uh, even higher. Uh, so there's that aspect. And then, and this is something that, of course, is very key uh, to Iron Tree, is that there's the, the question of business disruption, disruption and business continuity. So if we have a ransomware attack, um, it's not um, just, uh, and this is of course a, a, a big deal, 
uh, data loss, loss of, of IP and reputational loss, um, it's also the challenge that you have of getting back up and running again. And whether you can successfully recover data, and this is of course where I and Tree come in in terms of, <laughs> of backup and recovery of data, uh, but it's the, the time lost while you have applications and systems um, that are down. Um, if, for example, you're in the healthcare business and you're running a hospital, then you have a situation which threatens lives. So this is uh, a big deal. Hopefully this gives us a sense of, in broad terms, the sort of implications of data breach and of, of cyber attacks, and uh, particularly how we address ransomware, which is very prevalent. It's not going away any time soon. I think we can go on to the next slide, David. Okay. Um, and individuals uh, are, of course, not immune um, either. Uh, and it kind of comes back to where we sort of started the commentary around this, and that is that um, our digital world um, is now such an embedded part of life and what we carry on our uh, devices uh, that uh, our mobile devices obviously need to be uh, protected. And <clears throat> we need to ensure uh, that we are good in terms of our security hygiene, whether we're looking at ourselves in the individual context or the business context. And of course the two um, intersect, right? Um, because you think about how much we do uh, business with on sort of personal devices. You can't really separate um, the two. David, any, any other thoughts from your side as to who needs to take cybersecurity seriously and what some of the implications are around this? Well, I think, you know, as you've said, everyone needs to take it seriously. And, and I think particularly now that people are waking up to the um, ability to work efficiently remotely, you're now getting a situation where it's even more important to be protected because you've got kind of sometimes maverick people working remotely, not always on corporate devices. And, you know, you, if you're working on, an, on a device which is unprotected or unmanaged, there's the risk of damage and reputational uh, um, issues for, for your company as well. So um, I think it's, it's kind of becoming even more relevant now. Exactly, yes. So we really need to be, if you will, um, good um, IT citizens uh, in terms of uh, we have a responsibility to ourselves, to our families, to our businesses. Um, you've got to think of security as something that is really uh, embedded and uh, it's, it's a mindset. And of course it involves technology, but it also, it involves um, being educated. Um, it's about having good um, hygiene, IT hygiene habits, all of those things as well. And of course, in a business context, uh, it's about um, having uh, policies and procedures and training and education and, and not just thinking that we can buy the latest technology and implement it. Yeah. I think we, we, we try to create a little analogy and when we thought about it, uh, you know, if you think of most of you watching would be living in some kind of um, freehold property or secure complex and and really what you've got is these different layers of physical security. You've got your uh, house, you've got your alarm and your armed response, your burglar, guard, burglar bars, your guard dog, your electric fence, all that kind of stuff. And, and yet most people in small businesses um, don't think that they should have layers of security um, in, their, in their business as well. So if you think about it, you, you know, it's not good enough to just have like a a little pre antivirus or traditional antivirus protection. You need to have your data backed up. You need to have some kind of the term you mentioned earlier, Jeremy, business continuity, that there's some kind of disaster recovery um, solution in place that if something happens in your office, you can carry on working. You need, 
you know, the firewalls and the cybersecurity, web filtering, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and patch management, very important. But I, the whole idea of this diagram is start thinking about your business like you would talk about your, your home security, that you, you really need all of this, um, all of these layers in place to be totally protected. You want to add anything to that, Jeremy? No, I think that's that says it well. Cool. Um, and just to say, um, the point about layers of security um, is is key here, in the sense what we've tended to see in terms of IT security is um, companies have invested a lot of money on, for example perimeter security and cloud-based mail security. And we found that, uh, and we'll get into this in a bit more detail later, but endpoint security as a category has been uh, neglected. And of course our world has changed where um, increasingly we're finding that we, the perimeter has shifted, so to speak. And the traditional campus and uh, business network, that concept doesn't uh, exist anymore, which is of course why we need to look for innovative cloud hosted, cloud managed solutions uh, that really recognize that the user is now the perimeter. Does that make sense and tie in with what you've got in mind? Yeah, so, so absolutely. And when Jeremy mentions endpoints, just so that you guys all understand, the endpoint is the device that you're actually connecting from. So it's your laptop or your uh, mobile device or your tablet. And, you know, so, so this webinar is really about elements in the cloud that, that you should have in your business. And, and in this case, cloud-hosted cybersecurity. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the product that we recommend, which is the Panda product, which Jeremy represents. But why do you need cloud-hosted cybersecurity as opposed to the traditional, well, I've got uh, some, some kind of antivirus solution which, which I've loaded on each uh, desktop on my server, and it's like an agent which runs and downloads a, a new antivirus patch once a day. Why, why should you look at cloud-hosted cybersecurity? And there are a lot of good reasons for that, and, and Jeremy will do a little demo just now on what, what a cloud console looks like. But... Basically, the, the, the important points we've put onto the slide, so effective remote management, and that's really important because as, you know, as businesses become more um, connected, well, everyone's connected, and especially now with fiber, more devices are connected, more things are happening, um, there's more intercommunication between, between different um, players in, 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 in your business, whether it's internal, external customers, vendors, et cetera, banks. Um, you, need, you need to be able to manage the environment. Now, it's very difficult to do this if you don't have some kind of console, uh, and in, our, in this case, a cloud-based console, which can be managed from where, wherever the manager is, and whether that's your IT manager internally or a support company that you're using, a cloud-hosted um, system uh, gives you a great management console, which Jeremy's going to show you. Patch management to us is an absolute no-brainer. You have to have patch management. And we'll talk a little bit more about patch management during this presentation. But really what patch management is, is the um, system in place that all of the devices that you're using are, are updated with the latest software, the latest operating system, the latest applications. And we're going to talk a little bit more just now about common vulnerabilities. Um, what the Panda guys have told me, and uh, Jeremy, I know Matthew's mentioned this a couple of times, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have an environment where all of your devices are properly patched, so they are downloading the latest uh, security patches for all of your software and your operating systems, you're kind of eliminating 90% plus of the threat of, of being hit with malware. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that just now. Um, traditional antivirus is dead. Why am I saying that? What traditional antivirus does is it downloads a, an, a virus signature typically once a day. So what happens is um, the antivirus company is collecting data during the day of all new malware which has been released into the wild. And at the end of the day, they, they send down a file to your desktop or your server which gets distributed 
which includes all of the new malware they discovered that day. But that leaves you compromised because what's happened between the last time you, you downloaded that patch and the next time is called the zero day window, which is in bullet point three, which means you are, are, are susceptible to any malware which has been released in between those two downloads of the, of the signature files. What cloud antivirus does, or cloud cybersecurity, should I say, is it accesses an online database. And in, in the case of Panda, Panda, which Jeremy will tell you a bit more later, is a Spanish company, which has got a laboratory in, uh, I think, Madrid, with, uh, I don't know how many, 20 or 30 or 40 engineers, who throughout the day are, are, are updating their database with newly recognized strains of malware, which are then automatically available to your device. So you, you close that zero day window. Um, cyber, so cloud hosted cyber security protects against all cyber crime and Jeremy might uh, mention a term just now, EDR, endpoint detection and response, which is more than just antivirus. So this is a technology that actually recognizes what your normal behavior is and all your users have similar but slightly different normal behavior. They use different applications on a daily basis, or the company might use an application which is bespoke to that company. So what uh, the, the technology does is it learns the behavior of your company and the people in your company, and it adapts the security to match that. So if something um, tries to infiltrate your, your environment, which is not normal behavior, it'll flag it as irregular and it'll give you the opportunity to say, no, I, I don't use that. It's not, it's not good where, so let's block it. And then over time, your IT manager would build up a list of what they call good wear and, and uh, bad wear, which, which obviously is self-explanatory. And the other thing it does, it also recognizes threats which, which may not have been recognized yet. So if you get a, uh, an email with what looks like a word.doc attachment, and that you're actually not seeing that it's a word dot 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 bad or something, um, and you click on that attachment thinking someone sent you a Word document, the technology would recognize that this is not a file or an application or an executable, which is acting in the way that a regular Word doc, doc would, and, and it'll block it. So what we're saying is that good cloud-hosted cyber security will protect against all cyber crime. Um, the device control, which we use at, at Iron Tree quite extensively, what we've done is lock down all of our machines that you cannot introduce malware through a USB or a removal hard drive or any other external form of media um, unless you, you ask our administrator to allow you to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, web filtering, that you can block specific categories of websites or specific websites permanently or at certain times during the day. And that's a great aid to productivity as well. I'm going to um, show you, this is just a view of, of the console, but I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen at the moment. And I'm going to hand over to Jeremy to do a, a small demo. Is that okay with you, Jeremy? Yes, I'm ready when you are. Okay. Right, so I've stopped my share. You can go. Great, okay. Okay, can you just tell me that it's uh, coming up on your side? I will Fine. tell you. Uh, are we ready? Okay, we got it. Okay. All right, good. Uh, so if I can just clarify, if I go to the computers tab here, is that changing? Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. So we've spoken about AV and then advanced protection and this um, industry term EDR, so endpoint detection and response. Let me kind of explain to you through the console uh, what the difference looks like in terms of the technology. Uh, and I'm gonna do that by showing you our AD360 product. And what that does, it combines the features that we would associate with um, AV or the kind of current sort of industry generic term is endpoint protection, EPP, with uh, the new advanced 
capabilities that typically come from an EDR class product, right? And the way I show that to you is uh, we'll take a look at our AV engine quickly and the detections that that generates. And uh, here we go. Uh, so we, we still have an AV engine uh, that deals with your sort of commoditized malware, right? And that's as much detail as, as you get. And that would be common to any of your standard AVs, right? Now let's go uh, to our pods, uh, which are giving you a view of activity. And that's derived from our EDR class technology. Uh, one of the things to point out is if you see classification of all programs run and scanned, what we're seeing there is that we are giving a view of the percentage of trusted programs. And this is where we become very different to, to your traditional AV because we monitor 100% of processes that are running on your endpoints. And then we validate every process. And so you have a binary delivered where um, a process is positively validated as either malware or goodware. And what we will do, we can run the protection in various modes, but we can run it in lock mode so that we will block any unknown process until it's validated. And if you're looking for a technology uh, that will effectively stop ransomware, this product will deliver uh, on that promise with this, with this model. And it's really important that you have a technology like this on your endpoints because we can do all the right things in terms of perimeter protection and email security. And <clears throat> we're not going to say, don't do those things, but then you, if you do have something that gets through, if somebody does break over your electrified fence, and they get through your burglar bars, what defense mechanism do you have inside the house? And that's what we're speaking to with our class of technology. So there you go, there's your trusted programs. What you can also see is that we identify uh, malware, but then we're able to distinguish malware exploits and pups, which are potentially unwanted programs. Those are things like the sort of ask toolbar that gets downloaded and is uh, stuck in your browser. And the reason that we identify pups is because they introduce risk into the business. People end up connecting to services unwittingly and getting involved in running applications, maybe personally, uh, that uh, introduce uh, additional bandwidth uh, used and, and risk to the business. Now, very quickly, I'll give you a view of, uh, from a, an advanced protection perspective, uh, just uh, how the technology delivers uh, insight in a way that is not feasible with your traditional AV. So I I've got a, a kind of a view of potential indication of compromise. And what I want to explain here is the reason we're seeing activity is because we've allowed the technology for this site to run in what we call audit mode. If we weren't doing that, then there would be nothing to show you. And what you can see is we pick up on whether malware is run, whether it's access data, and whether it's made external connections. Of course, those are the th three things that uh, indicate a potential compromise, right? And I'm just going to give you a very quick view of the forensics here. So uh, let's pick up on, and this is, of course, is uh, quite topical. It was just uh, 50 years uh, last year the, that we saw the, um, the anniversary of the, um, of the lunar uh, landing. And <clears throat> we have a user that's picked up on what they think is an MP4, right? Video of said lunar landing in 1969. What they don't see is the double extension and that this is actually an executable and a very nasty Trojan right? And with our technology, we have a full view of exactly what's happened. And we're able to see where uh, the 
infection came in on, which endpoint, and who the user was that was logged on at the time. And then this feeds back, of course, in being able to do the sort of remedial action and harden our policies for, in terms of, say, um, uh, what services users are connecting to and making people more accountable. What I can also see is the scope of the problem, which other endpoints in the organization have been um, infected down at the bottom there. And if we go to activity details, what you're seeing here is a chronology. It's all of the, the actions taken by this malware, right? And I can sort of pick up on what damage it might have done in terms of, uh, say, registry keys that it's run. And it gets more interesting when we look at it uh, visually. So what you've got here is a graphical representation of the life cycle of this malware. And we represent it on a timeline that we can manipulate and really understand what's going on. Right? Um, so I don't want to step over time here. So very quickly, just want to explain some of the other capabilities of the product. Uh, so we have, uh, David mentioned web, web filtering. Uh, so if we <clears throat> uh, just check, our, so uh, sorry, I've brought up a, a profile uh, where we, we don't have that to hand. There we go. Uh, web access and spam. Uh, so this is category-based web filtering. Uh, all of the categories are managed on the back end. And this gives you a view of what uh, classes of site uh, users are going into. Right? Um, and we can kind of uh, drill down on that as well. Uh, we've picked up all the users that are going to gambling sites. This assumes that they're allowed to. So what we are able to do is, is introduce policies uh, where we can block users uh, from categories of site. We also have explicit blacklisting and explicit whitelisting. Yeah. And then finally, let's just touch, I think, on patch management, because as we uh, spoke of earlier, uh, this is something that you can really, if you bring in effective patch management, you will reduce your attack surface. And the significant ransomware uh, attacks that we saw in terms of uh, WannaCry and not Petcher uh, would have been avoidable um, if uh, there was the appropriate patches um, applied uh, that, that would have addressed the vulnerabilities that were exploited uh, by those uh, ransomware attacks. And you'll see also just how easy it is uh, to manage endpoints from a patch perspective. Not only do we pick up what, what needs to be patched and the detail on the, uh, in this case, critical patch category, but very simply and quickly, I can checkbox those endpoints and I can actually install those patches remotely. And I think I'll leave it there, David, unless there's anything else that you would like us to bring into play here in terms of console demo. I think that's great, Jeremy. And obviously, you know, anyone who's really interested, we can uh, uh, extend this discussion to assume with that person uh, uniquely. Dave? Yes. I just want to ask Jeremy one or two questions. Jeremy, I mean, obviously, you've been in the industry for a long time. Do you find today that uh, viruses um, have been kind of replaced by ransomware? Because it gets a bit blurry, is, is, is ransomware a virus? I mean, at the end of the day, the impact is the same. It's something that infects your data and uh, you can't get it. So, you know, you can't get your data. So whether it's a, a virus in the traditional sense of 10 years ago or ransomware, I mean, it's the same thing to an end user. So is ransomware the main thing today? Yes. I think if you look at what are the, the threats that you need to prevent and mitigate, you still need to uh, make sure that you can address um, your commoditized malware. 
because we also see old viruses come back into the wild again, okay? Which is okay. why I've, I've scrolled down, why we still uh, deal with uh, your, your more classic um, file-based malware, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but increasingly though, and this is I think what you're alluding to, the big issue is, is, is ransomware, which is why to address ransomware, your AV is no longer effective. It's why so many people get hit by ransomware because uh, in, in most cases, they will have some type of protection, typically a pattern-based protection. And AV, uh, generally speaking, is not able to identify a, a ransomware. Okay, uh, Jeremy, sort of, can I yeah, you? Yeah. yeah. Because, I, you know, David, I don't know where you're going to with this presentation and the rest of the slides, but to me, our audience, and I'm speaking for myself, I would like you to spend five minutes just talking about that because for most of us who have grown up in this world and, and really whether you're 25 years and over, you know, we were used to running a little app that was in the system tray on the bottom right and it said, you are protected, update your definitions and everybody thinks they're cool. Now, Jeremy, because you're in the industry, you maybe take it for granted. But I still think that 98% of businesses and people out there think that's enough. So when you talk about, you know, that's not, it can't protect you. I'd like you to spend five minutes just explaining that very concept. Yes. So and I think it, it has to do with how AV is, what it's premised on. And if you think about it, antivirus is all about definition, what is known, right? You do get, and of course the industry ends up um, confusing customers, frankly, uh, sort of, uh, they talk about new gen AV or they do have advanced AV, um, but we see there are a lot of products uh, which they use, for example, uh, collective intelligence models, uh, they use a thing, <coughs> a mathematical, probabilities uh, thing called heuristics, uh, all of this advanced stuff. But go back to the core. They're all based on looking for malware, right? Yes. Now, when you're dealing with an advanced ransomware attack, which has been put together using techniques which your pattern-based protection can't identify, it needs a totally different approach. And it, it's really about uh, zero trust, or if we think about this in sort of legal terms, we presume that everybody's guilty until we've proven them innocent, right? Okay. Does that make sense to you as a concept? Yes. yes. Which is why, and I've still left the screen share open just to perhaps talk through some of these things in practical terms, why you can see there we're validating programs and ensuring that they're trusted. Another way you can describe this, by the way, to kind of get a view of this, is that it's managed um, application whitelisting. And it, the, the nice thing is it's done by us. So you as the customer, as the Iron Tree customer subscribed for this service, you don't have to make those decisions. That gets done by AD360 because we tend to talk about products, but this is actually a service. We refer to it interestingly as an attestation service. That is that we attest that a running application is legitimate. I think back over to you, Stephen. Yeah, okay, so that makes a lot of sense to me. So, so you know, for me, uh, virus software, antivirus software just doesn't cut it anymore. So you need kind of more services. Uh, I mean, the ransomware, these files can lie dormant on your machine before they execute. And, you know, why does antivirus software actually not pick that up and say that's a virus? Do you know the answer to that? Well, it, <clears throat> yes, because it comes back 
uh, to the fact that it is limited by what is known. Okay. And the, the, the techniques that your threat actors use nowadays are such that they can put together very quickly a malicious process that is not identified because the, the AV has no point of reference to say this is malware, right? Okay, Jeremy, so I'm getting it. So you basically say that everything is guilty until proven innocent. And what that means in this world is any application that hasn't been authorized by your service, you actually won't allow to run. So if a ransomware program, try, it's got to run, it's got to do something to encrypt your files, you'll say, hold it, red flag, we don't know about this, stop until the user intervenes or you guys, your attestation service, give it the, the go ahead. Exactly, yes. Okay, I'll get so, it. And uh, I mean, I assume that you have some server running in the cloud which knows about all, let's say, the cool, good uh, programs out there that you'll let run. Uh, what happens if, let's say I'm a programmer myself and I write an application that you guys don't know about or your attestation service hasn't got it in its dictionary, let's call it, and then how long does it take before you say, okay, this is cool? Or does the user say, look, I'm happy with this? So let's refer to the console. Can you see on the right-hand side there, there's a pod which says, currently blocked program is being classified. Yes. Now, generally, you wouldn't see uh, the number that you see here, all right? Yes. Uh, in the sense that what we recommend is the first time we're putting the product down, so we install an agent, um, otherwise it's all cloud hosted, we manage through the console, right? Yes. And we go through a learning phase. So we learn about the environment that we're deployed in, right? Okay. And every day, of course, this is speaking back to how do we go about doing this? We are profiling new applications, right? The other interesting thing is we're speaking about what is knowledge-based, right? So we kind of go through a process. We check if a process, first of all, is malicious. If it is, that's simple, right? We stop it. Then we check if it's a known goodware process. And what we, by the way, in terms of how applications run, they are profiled behaviorally. Okay, so what do they do in practice? What communications do they perform in terms of normal operation, right? Uh, and then we can make a decision, if it's known goodware, we can allow it to run. Now there's a third step in this sort of set of filters, if you will, where we've build, been building up a, an event data lake with this knowledge base that you were speaking of, and that feeds a machine learning model, right? Yeah. So we can make, where we can't work explicitly of what is knowledge-based, our machine learning referencing uh, our knowledge base, our event lake, can make very good decisions on whether we're dealing with a malicious process or goodware, right? Works ex exceptionally well. But finally, we don't cop out and generate suspicious flagging, um, which a lot of vendors do. Okay? Yes. Uh, and you, you end up with um, alert fatigue. And mm. there's a stat out there that only sort of 4% of, of alerts get investigated in security terms. Right? By the way, I think that alert fatigue is a fantastic term because everybody gets excited with the novelty and then on day three, you're just saying yes, yes, yes. I keep seeing that. I ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what we do for the very tiny number of uh, executables or processes that we that none of those mechanisms I've referred to can classify is we actually have humans do it. Right. So we have security analysts and data analysts in Panda Labs and we'll manually classify. Now, as it happens, that's only 0.02% of the 
of the total number of processes we're having to deal with. In other words, our automated systems do most, pretty well all the work, but we, we ensure that we never end up with any suspicious flagging. We'll always give you that very clean binary. I'm either good or bad. Okay, great. Okay. Makes me feel safe. That's great. Yes. Right. Uh, and this safe. technology really works. I'm going to hand over to you, David. I'll stop Thank the share. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Jeremy. Okay. Dave, I'm sorry I went off on a tangent. I think there's just so much misunderstood. And I think that people will better able to protect themselves if they do understand what's actually going on. No, no, I think your comments were very valid. And Jeremy, thanks for the great answers there as well. Okay, going to try to speed it up a little bit. Um, I was going to tell you a story, but um, I'll get that back to that in a second. I just want to go to this, this next slide. So, I mean, I think Jeremy's spoken a little bit about this as well, but um, I just want to speak about common vulnerabilities, which is, which is quite an important one, and that goes to the patch management. And what, what I just want to stress there is that uh, what we found is, and we've, we've done a lot of calling to our client base and asking, are they patched? And do they even know if they're patched? And let's just reiterate, patching means that your system is updated with all of the latest um, uh, software application patches and, and operating system patches. And think about it like this. If you are not patching, what are cyber criminals, um, what's the easiest point for them to, to enter your, your environment? It's through an unpatched uh, device. It's like going out of your house and leaving the front door open. Even if the alarm's on, the door's open, someone can run in and steal the laptop off your counter and run out. Cyber criminals are looking for the most vulnerable systems, and those are systems which are not patched. So if you're un unsure that whether you're patched or not, um, you, should, you should be talking to us and let us run a patch management audit on your business environment. Ayaka is telling me I've got to speed up, so I'm going to uh, skip past uh, this one. And I'm going to skip past that one just to talk about it for a second. That's what Jeremy was talking about. If you like downloading toolbars that have been recommended as, as better than what you're using and you think this looks cool. And the way I can sum that up really is someone made a great comment that I saw in, a, in another presentation. And they said, well, you've got to think of it like this. If, uh, if you're using something, a, a free product on the internet, then actually you are the product because they're using your data, uh, potentially. Um, I think we've covered a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, cybersecurity is, is not only a tech issue, it's, it's a business continuity, uh, employee education, uh, culture issue as well. And I'm just going to skip past this one because we've just to sum up, we've seen this, uh, we've seen this graphic. Uh, and then I don't know if you want to just spend one minute just talking a little bit more about who Panda is, Jeremy. Thank you, David. Yes, so um, European based company. Uh, we've been in the game since uh, 1990 and two big things really uh, about where we're at today. Uh, one is that we pioneered uh, the management of security products from the cloud. So we have really mature, robust um, console and communication technology. Uh, coupled with the fact that we were an early mover into this so-called uh, EDR category. Uh, so we have this combination of strong management capability that scales from small to, to big companies in terms of deployment with a very robust uh, protection model that speaks to today's threats. And not only do we deliver on the attestation service to validate your applications so that you're running trusted programs. We also do threat hunting and, and investigation, and we build that into um, our service um, as, as well. And just to comment that we have 
um, a, a nice modular set of options for you. And all of these are available uh, through iEntry and their, their uh, monthly billing mechanism. So we can start you if you want with our endpoint protection, we still do that. And then take you all the way through to the uh, AD360, the EPP with EDR all fully combined. Then you can add to that our advanced reporting tool, our patch management, and also full encryption which we haven't really touched on, but just to mention that, because that, that speaks to data security and is something also that you may want to think about in terms of your security strategy. Back over to you, David. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks a lot. Okay, so just a little bit of slide, which I think we've discussed most of these um, elements as well. Um, so the one, two, three, four, six bullet points, secure passwords and two-factor authentication is becoming quite a big uh, topic at the moment, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. I think we'd need another five or ten minutes to talk more about that. But I think we've spoken about most of the points on this slide. I think I'm just going to end off. I know Yoko says uh, I shouldn't be telling you stories now, but I am going to end off with two stories. And really... Uh, the, the first story is about a client of ours, one of our, in fact, one of our channel partners who phoned up and said, uh, you, you've, you've got my client to put on this 8360 Panda technology, and they've got hit by ransomware. So what do you say to that? And this was about six months ago, and it was the first time that we've ever had a client using this technology that actually got hit with ransomware. And obviously, the customer was blaming their service provider who was blaming us. And, and I'm so glad Jeremy covered this in his demonstration because what we actually did is we went onto the management console and we actually traced the, um, the history of this, this compromise on the client system. And what we found is that one of the um, people in the office received an email with a malicious attachment, clicked on the attachment, the Panda technology said, hold on a second, this is not kosher. I don't think you should run this. And the... This, this operator ignored that advice, clicked on it, and it gave another warning, actually, and said, are you sure? And she said, yes, and clicked on this attachment, and literally within about 30 or 40 seconds, their whole network had been infected with, with this strain of ransomware. But our management console allowed us in our call center to actually drill down and send a report to both the reseller and the customer to say, actually, the technology did stop this attack, but but you're um, un well, un not uneducated, but unaware uh, employee actually let it through. And then the last story I want to tell is um, one of our retail customers, and this goes to the common vulnerabilities and the patch management, a retail customer who's got approximately 300 um, restaurants, uh, who, who had an, who's got an IT manager who had been working through an out of, date remote um, uh, control tool and, and didn't want to update this tool because the licensing had become quite expensive. So the, the version they were using was five or six years old. It still seemed like it was working perfectly. It allowed the IT manager to remotely support all of the um, outlets and do whatever he needed to do. But unbeknownst to him, there was a common vulnerability, which was, at some point was um, uh, uh, used by a cyber crim crim criminal attack uh, who found a backdoor in the remote management tool, which then infiltrated the entire uh, end user network of, of uh, restaurant outlets who were all running an unsupported version of Windows because once again, it was a cost issue. They didn't really want to update and license a new version of Windows. And the result is that 220 of their sites uh, lost total ability to transact for about four days. Um, and that, that was because they were, were not patched or didn't have the latest version of the operating system. Um, um, right, Yako, I'm, I'm going to heed your advice and go through this quickly. So that's the last slide. And I hope this has been an informative presentation to you. And thank you very much, Jeremy, for for joining us as a panelist. I think your input was really good. And Steve, thanks for highlighting those issues. I think it was also very relevant. And Yaka, back over to you. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate the, 
the, the mentions here and there. Um, all right, guys. Yeah, this was a, an extremely informative session. I always enjoy uh, listening to Jeremy. Um, I think his, his insight is, is absolutely amazing. And it's great to hear from an expert in this regard. Um, guys, I've activated the poll. Uh, for those of us who've uh, joined us for, for more than once, you realize the poll is something that you need to spot and you need to find it. It's hidden somewhere on your, on your Zoom console. Um, no, no, Yoko, we, we're not seeing it again, huh? All right, let me just relaunch it. Yeah, yeah good. Excellent. All right. So yeah, just go through those questions. Um, this poll's structured a little bit differently. We're actually asking you to give us some insight on your current infrastructure. If there's elements that you really want to look at, um, that you want to kind of just secure your secure uh, your security perimeter. So yeah, um, we'll maybe we'll give you a, we'll start giving you a call probably later in the week based on the answers that you've given us. Um, I think there's a, there's a few very interesting elements there that could help your security layer of your business. So I'm going to leave that up and running for the next uh, two minutes or so. Um, as always, we're going to send out the recording. If you want to forward it to a friend, if you, if you know of a, of a colleague that really needs to listen to this, uh, I encourage you to do that. Um, David, just remind me, our next webinar is happening on Wednesday. And Wednesday. Uh, it's an interesting one. Yeah, it's about Active Directory in the cloud, which is kind of a little bit more in-depth technical um, discussion, but very, very interesting uh, discussion about how to have, uh, as Stephen calls it, a traffic cop that controls the, the entire um, environment around your enterprise, even if you are working remotely. So I think it's quite a good one to watch. All right, yeah, looking forward to that one. I think Keith is joining us for that one. All right, guys. Um, New week, new lockdown, or same lockdown, I suppose. Um, we're going we're gonna to keep uh, sending you some good information. Um, so, yeah, I encourage you to join us for the following webinars. That's still, that's still coming. Um, but I think that's a wrap from, from all of us. Uh, yeah, can I just end with a 30-second concept? You may. I watched a great movie last night called Heat with Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Val Kilner. And I was thinking to myself, those guys, uh, I'm sure a lot of the audience has, has seen it. They took real risks, robbing banks with hard tech, but putting themselves on the line. And yes, I can romanticize the movie because I love Robert De Niro. But today, these cyber criminals are actually cowards. They take no risk. They sit, as David even gave an example, on ships. No one knows who they are. They're paid anonymously through Bitcoin. And they have absolutely zero morals. I almost see the old criminals that in a weird way had morals. I mean, some of them got killed. These dudes have no shame. And my maid actually got hit the other day. And like you would think, like, here's a person who doesn't really have much resources. How could they do this to her? They don't care. And that's because of, of, the, of the, the environment in which they can operate, they will do everything and anything shameless to whoever they want. And as businesses and people, actually, in our personal capacities have to be so aware of this stuff. And the internet is just, it's a free fall as far as these guys are concerned. So please, I'm sure you do take it seriously, but try and understand it a bit as well. And I think it will make you more engaged and therefore, you'll be better protected in the, in the, in the long run. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, it's an absolute awesome movie. Um, so, so good spot. I think uh, we all should go see if we can watch it in this week. Um, all right, guys. Uh, thanks for, for, your, for your votes. I see the polls almost uh, filled up. Um, but yeah, I think that's a wrap from our side. You must have a, you must have a great day. Thanks, thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Well, everybody. Yeah.